All right, so I literally grabbed a whole bunch of models. Uh, right here, we have some actual real phones, okay? Here, I was gonna show you guys some of those uh, disc protrusions we talked about. Um, in lecture, uh, and if you're not in my lecture, then, you know, obviously we didn't talk about it. And then I have here, I have some of the um, specific C1, C2, very, very specific vertebrae then a model of a basic cervical vertebrae, and we'll go over the different features. Uh, thoracic, this looks more like a transitional. So this would be like T11, T12, and then here's a lumbar um, vertebrae. And we'll look at the different structures of all those. And remember, I told you guys, literally there's going to be one or two of these on your practical. So you should be able to look at it and tell me what it is, all right? If it's specifically C1, the Atlas, very, very definitive. All right, we talked about how Atlas was, <coughs> that was a Greek, uh, Roman, Greek, I think. Greek, and he held the world up, all right? There's a picture of Atlas. That's how they named it, all right? Because your occipital, your occipital condyle of your skull sits on there and it gives you that flexion extension motion where you can say yes. And then C2 here has the dens, the odontoid process is named after, looks like a tooth. There's a ligament that goes across here to hold it into place. And this is where the majority of your rotation in your cervical spine or your neck takes place. And then we talked a little bit about the orientation of all these facet joints. I'm gonna see if I can get this. Sorry. I'm doing this on my phone, so I'm not sure it's gonna come out. Let me grab something super quick here. All right, so if I can see this. All right, and then you can see the orientation of this facet joint there. This determines the motion, all right? And if we go here, see the angle there? Now, if I go into the thoracic area, the angle, the articulations change for different motion. And then if we go into the lumbar, the angle of that facet joint um, is different. <clears throat> and remember in, in class I said, I can tell when a patient lays down on the table <clears throat> and I start palpating all of these, I can tell you instantly, I'll say to them, well, listen, were you a uh, cheerleader? Uh, did you do ballet? Um, you know, and they'll say, well, how in the world did you know that? Because they hyperextend, or they do all kinds of um, bizarre things, and they literally take these facet joints and they jam them, all right? So it can cause some major problems in the uh, thoracic spine, specifically. All right, it can literally take out that kyphosis, it can alter it. Um, we talked a little bit about forward head carriage and hyperlordosis in the lower back. All right, with, um, you know, it can happen with women if they have multi, um, what is it called, multi-party, or yeah, if they have a lot of children, all right, or with a lot of men and women, both who have metabolic syndrome, where you have all that excess weight, um, in your abdomen, literally pulling your spine forward, all right? And uh, if I can, I'm gonna pop up that image of that uh, MRI of that cerebral spine where that uh, patient had complete imbrication of their spinal cord. You can literally see <clears throat> spinal cord going through here. You can see where all of these vertebral bodies were pushed backwards to head away. Um, stenosis impinging on that spinal cord, right? But anyway, I want to just pop into the book here and show you some of the differences of these vertebrae. All right. Maybe I'm trying not to get dizzy here, folks. <clears throat> All right, so there's your basic vertebral column. This is anterior. Remember, we talked about the anterior longitudinal ligament. And we have the posterior longitudinal ligament, so that th these can't shift, shouldn't be able to shift back and forth. All right, helps with that. Here, if you'll notice, this person has a double major scoliosis. 
<clears throat> and I showed you guys how that would cause the ribs to um, rotate, rotate the entire thoracic cage. And then if you look in here, right, you can see the heart of the pericardium. So realize how if that's shifting, what that would do to um, the mediastinum, the whole area. All right, here, all right, <clears throat> this is lordosis. See how this is extremely, extremely curved? All right, so that cervical spine should be curving here, then you should have your kyphosis here, and then you should have your lordosis here. And these develop um, from infancy, and then as you <clears throat> start crawling, it distributes the weight uh, differently, and can it just starts to cause these uh, primary and secondary curves to develop. All right, here is a kyphosis or kyphotic curve. So this is, you see how completely over-exaggerated. And I said, because you know the difference between convex and concave, all right, I'm mean, like that. So this is likely an only patient. And then I talked to you in class about <clears throat> when I'm at the gym and I see a lot of uh, these people over lift, dead lifting, dead rows, all this weight on their shoulders and they literally start compressing, crushing these vertebral bodies, especially in the thoracic area. And that can cause the anterior portion of that vertebral body to um, flatten or, or lessen the curb. All right, so you, now you have a wedge shape. All right, so it should be like that. But if you compress the anterior portion, the posterior portion stays the same. It causes that to curve even more. Right. All right, so I kind of wanted to get it real quick, get into this. <clears throat>